Uh, this is Rebecca Strauss with Miller Johnson. Welcome to everyone uh, to our webinar this morning. Uh, one of the more important webinars uh, we've had here at Miller Johnson, in my opinion. Uh, we're entering a new phase of the pandemic. Uh, I'm grateful that we're entering a new phase of the pandemic, uh, coming out of it, getting back to work, getting back to some normal things. But that does cause some issues uh, for individuals and workplaces, right? Uh, as you all know, as you're guiding your workplaces uh, through this time. So today we are very lucky to have two experts from Pine Rest join us to help us not only manage our employees' anxieties as they enter this transitional period, but also our own as leaders, right? We, we as in, in the employment community uh, are experiencing our own level of stress and have, and how does that affect us as leaders and how can we lead effectively through that. So uh, today, uh, again, we are very, very lucky to have Pine Rest Christian Mental Health Services join us. Uh, they're a nonprofit healthcare organization founded in 1910, and they are uh, the fourth largest behavioral health provider in the United States, which is absolutely amazing, based here in Grand Rapids. Uh, Pine Rest, in addition to many, many other things, has an EAP program and they currently support around 400 employers through that program. Uh, this morning, we are lucky to have two folks from Pine Rest with us. Uh, Bob Vandepoel is the Executive Director of Pine Rest Christian Mental Health Services EAP program. And Jean Holthaus is the Southwest Regional Director for Pine Rest and also manages the telehealth clinic. So welcome to both of you. Jean and Bob, you know I'm personally um, just very excited to have you here and learn what you have to say and how we can help our employers uh, in our entire community through this next phase. With that, I'll turn it over to you. And well, Rebecca, thank you, thank you. And to all participants, so glad you're here. Um, I participated in one of these webinars April of last year <clears throat> when the pandemic was this new phenomena that you know, we're all sure was going to end in a month or so. And boy, doesn't it feel like a long time. And, and I know that you've been out in the community serving employers, and this is what your 140 something webinar specific to how do we roll with, with this pandemic. Thank you for what you've done in the community. Pleased to uh, co-present with my colleague, Jean as well. Jean, take it away. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for having us. So, um, We've been in the pandemic for a long time now, long enough that we actually have some data and the data can actually be helpful for us as we're looking at how do we establish a new normal. Um, we've all kind of decided we can't go back to what was in some ways, um, but we're figuring out how to move forward. So we're gonna start by looking at some of the data and then we're gonna look at kind of what that means for people as they're looking back. So um, when we look at in 2021, 64% um, of people that have been surveyed that are over the age of 18 are, are, heavy, are anxious. And when we look at what they're anxious about, they are more anxious actually about their loved ones getting COVID, particularly from them or sort of something that they would do, than they are about themselves getting COVID. But there's still a fairly high level of anxiety about that. Um, and, and when you look at that pandemic's effect upon mental health, the red line there is 2020 and the blue line is 2021. So we're seeing that the pandemic is negatively impacting mental health more in 2021 than in 2020, which makes sense because it's kind of that sustained pressing down that's been happening over time. And when you stress the system over time, bad things begin to happen. And the same thing, if we look at the increase in drinking and, and substance use from 2020, which is the blue, uh, sorry, 2020 is the red line, to 2021, we're seeing that that goes up as well, which means that you need to kind of be on the lookout for that in your workplaces and be aware that that's one of the coping mechanisms that people may be using. Because when we are anxious, we want to do whatever it takes to feel less anxious. And a glass of wine will make you feel less anxious for at least a little bit. Um, and one glass becomes two glasses, which becomes sometimes more than is helpful for some people. So just kind of some overall statistics to look at. More than half of us are really anxious and we're anxious about what this is gonna mean for the people we love and doing something that might hurt them and it's negatively impacting our mental health. When we think about coming back, 
um, and actually figuring out how do we move out of this kind of period of lockdown and really tight control. Um, what they found um, with the professors that are studying this have found is it's very much like when the military men or women return back from being um, deployed. Because when they're deployed, they have to use really, really extreme measures to stay safe. There's a real clear sense of if you do these things, you will be safe and not lose your life potentially. But if you don't do these things, there's a pretty good chance you might die. And when they come home and they're supposed to let go of all of those things and not need to be quite so vigilant, it's really, really hard to let go of those layers of things that have felt protective. And many people in our culture, as they think about, okay, I have been being told for months and months and months that I need to wear a mask and I need to be six feet apart from everybody. And I need to wash my hands after I touch anything. Um, when you start to even let go of not wearing or think about, I don't have to wear my mask into the grocery store. It feels scary in that same way. It feels like it could, it's dangerous in the same way that it would be for a military person that's been in a combat zone. So thinking about when we think about our employees coming back, that that's the level of fear and discomfort they're dealing with. And it's perfectly normal um, because their body has been on alert for months and months and months and months, trying to keep them safe and make sure that they didn't die. It was a real threat. And so it feels threatening to let go of all of those things. And different people will have a different level of um, fear connected to that coming back. But all of us have some, um, depending upon where we were to start with in terms of how we managed anxiety, we all have at least a little bit of discomfort associated with figuring out what it means to do this differently. Like when I'm go walk into a meeting now, do I shake your hand? Do I not shake your hand? Um, how do we have conversations about whether or not I believe in masks or I don't believe in masks and whether or not I believe in the vaccine or I don't believe in the vaccine? All of those things we all have a little discomfort around that. And some of us have more fear than other, others. So just being aware that that's a way to think about it in your head, that it's the same as those military people that have been deployed returning home. And I think There's, as a leader, yeah. Jean, I think as a leader, it's important to recognize that some of your people are impacted and anxious about things that you may or may not be. Yes. And their okay. reality is their reality. And you may not be that concerned, but some of your folks are, and that's yes. real for them. And some of your uh, folks aren't, <laughs> and that's real for them. Yeah. So we have to be aware of where we are in that, and it's impacted by our own experiences. So, so I have a daughter who's immunocompromised, so my level of awareness and my fear level is different than someone that might've had very different circumstances. And you're gonna have that, that continuum within your workplace. Layer on top of that, there were, when they are beginning to do some research about it, a lot of people are quite fearful that they're going to be discriminated against in some way, or they're going to be bullied in some way because of their beliefs about COVID and what they have or haven't done as a result of that. So um, there are people that have chosen not to be vaccinated that are fearful that this means they'll be discriminated against in some way when they come back. Or people who still want to wear a mask for some reason that are fearful if, that if they do that in an environment where they've been told that masks aren't needed, they may be bullied as a result of that. So we have to know that there's that level of fear that's also operating um, as people are thinking about coming back. So if we look at more generally what happens when someone's stressed, there are four things, there are four basically sources of stress and it's a helpful framework to think about. So one thing that causes stress for us is anything that's new or that we haven't experienced before. And for all of us, unless you stayed in the workplace all the way through and nothing has changed, um, there's novelty about figuring out what do we do with the new place our country is in, right? What do I do about masks or vaccines? There, there's some novelty associated with that. And that creates stress. Anything that threatens our either our real sense of control or our perceived sense of control. Many of us had a perceived sense that as long as I had a mask on and I was six feet away from you, I was safe. Or as long as I was in my house, I was safe. It may not have been a real sense of control, but it was a perceived sense of control. So working from home, for many people gave them a perceived sense of control. 
And if you're asking them to come back to the office, that feels like I'm losing control over whether or not I stay safe. Another source, anything that threatens my sense of competence. So if I haven't done it this way before, um, then it threatens my sense of control. So we do therapy and we have our therapists have all been working remotely. So they know now how to do therapy online. Um, they're not so sure how to do therapy in an office when they still need to wear a mask because we're a healthcare organization, right? So that calls their competence into question. And they're like, I'd rather stay home. Thank you very much. And I'm sure you each have some things you can relate to that. And then the fourth one, anything that's unpredictable, anything that I can't anticipate. So walking, if I've been working from home, walking back into an office where I don't know, can I anticipate that everybody in that office thinks the same way I do about whether or not you should be vaccinated? Can I anticipate that everybody in that office is going to wear a mask or not wear a mask in the same way that I think it should happen? Right? So there's some, some things that feel unpredictable in that as well. And when we get stressed, we move into fight, flight, freeze. And if you think about emotions as kind of being like a river, okay, all of us can swim in the river when it's calm. If we've had our swimming lessons, we know how to swim, right? We're assuming those things. But the rockier the river gets, the more turbulent it gets. So the more turbulent our emotions get, the more we begin to think, I want out of the river. And we're going to scramble to a bank. Um, and we scramble to a bank based upon our wiring, based upon past experiences. Some of us scramble to the bank of rigidity. Um, it's going to be my way or the highway. Line your ducks up behind me. And if you don't, I'll take you out. Um, and some of us scramble more towards the bank of chaos. We just kind of lay down and let, like say, la vie, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. I'm not going to try to exert control over it. We, we have a bank we like. Some of us are equal opportunity bank scramblers. Um, I personally like the bank of rigidity a lot. Just ask my kids, they'll tell you um, that if I get stressed, I want everything to work my way and don't question me. Thank you very much, right? Um, but other people are not like that. Amazingly, I have two children that scramble to the bank of chaos. So imagine that growing up in a family where I scramble to the bank of rigidity, right? So we have to know that some of our employees are gonna scramble to each one of those banks when they get stressed and you can kind of watch for it to happen and know, Oh, that's stress. I just want to say I've had bosses who were both. <clears throat> uh, I've had bosses who were both and um, both of them produced greater chaos. Even the rigid bosses produced Thank greater you. chaos. And the bosses that I've had that I appreciated them were the most were the ones who acknowledged, okay, there are real rocks in this stream, but we're staying in the water. And we, uh, we have faith and we have confidence and we have skills. And as scary as it is, we're going to acknowledge it and we're going to stay in the water and work this out together. That's Which is easier said than done. Yes. And we're oh, going to yeah. give you some skills to do that. But you're exactly right. That that's important to do. Um, and rigidity creates just as much chaos as chaos does. I personally can attest to it. So... There are also some things that happen just, just to be aware of. Um, when you're operating out of fight, flight, please, it's really hard to concentrate, um, which means that people make poor decisions. They don't think things through. That part of your brain that would think through the consequences of something before you do it just doesn't work very well when you're stressed. We also get really, really linear. A plus B equals C. We get really self-protective and we get really black and white. It's right or it's wrong, it's good or it's bad, which is really hard when you've got people with a lot of differing opinions about things in a room and they're all operating out of black and white, I'm right, you're wrong kind of thing. And they also just struggle with intrusive thoughts. They may be sitting at their desk trying to do a task and they're having thoughts about um, what ifs pop into their head that they're not asking for, but they're there. Um, and we're not particularly good at multitasking on the best of days. But when we're in fight, flight, freeze, because we're stressed, we really don't multitask well. Um, and a lot of our jobs actually ask us to do that. And we can also do something that's called dissociation, which just means we kind of disconnect from reality a little bit. And we're kind of walking alongside of ourselves. Let me go back to that. Uh, you, I think it was your third bullet, Gene. The linear emotional, because this is what you're going to see in a workplace a lot of times. So the more frightened that we are, the less the really smart part of our brain is activated and we go back to a more animalistic part of our brain that reacts quickly, reflectively. 
And it tends to think one thing caused one thing. It tends to be emotional. It tends to be self-protective because when we're afraid, that's what we do. How do I keep myself safe? Very black and white. And so this is where you're going to see the divisiveness within your work team and perhaps even within your leadership team. And you're going to have people who have a real hard time grasping the concept of gray. Everything will be black. Everything will be white. If you wear a mask and got vaccinated, you're a pathetic, fearful wimp. If you didn't, you're a selfish jerk, right? Those are the extremes of those. And you're going to experience both of those. And they're going to have a hard time grasping the concept that both can be true. (laughs) And someday we'll know maybe what is true. Mm -hmm. At this point, we don't. It's also true that when people are in that mode, they need a bad guy really badly. Um, Gene mentioned fight, flight, that? freeze, fight, flight, freeze, deer during hunting season, eyes are big, ears are up, nostrils are flared to find the danger. Then I decide, do I fight, take flight or freeze? And as a boss, as a leader, you are right in the crosshairs to be that bad guy, perhaps. Um, and so leading with some compassion, which we're going to come back to, is really important for there to be a foundation that just makes it a little harder for that bad guy to be you. And then also setting up for the bad guy not to be their colleague, their coworker. So you're also going to find people to be more emotional than they would normally be, including, got to be aware of you as well that you may find yourself, you may be someone that's normally pretty level and you find yourself feeling anxious in places you wouldn't normally feel anxious, more irritable than you would normally feel, or on the other side, more tearful or both irritable and tearful um, and a lot more fearful about things that would not necessarily make you feel fearful. So on one extreme, you're gonna see the people that are showing a lot more emotion. And on the other extreme, you're gonna see people that look numb to the world. They look like nothing's bugging them. And it's because their emotional system is kind of shut down. It's overwhelmed. And they may even experience suicidal homicidal thoughts because when we're in a negative emotional state for long enough, our body starts to try to find a way out. And it tries to find about any way out. Some of those ways are not rational ways out. And then people become way more behavioral reactive, behaviorally reactive as well. They may be pacing more or they're just avoiding. They're the people that are calling up going, sorry, I don't wanna come to work, I'm feeling anxious today. Um, Or I don't wanna talk to you because you don't have a mask on. Or I don't wanna talk to you because you do have a mask on, right? Or they're restless, they just can't seem to settle in. And as Bob was talking about before, they want a bad guy. We really, as even look culturally, we want this to be somebody's fault. And if they didn't do it the way we thought they should do it, we're going to blame them. And we like to blame leadership in those places a lot. Uh, but we'll blame, our, we'll blame our fellow co-workers as well. Um, and also that hypervigilance that I talked about on that first slide of the military. Um, and then you'll see people more prone to violent behavior, which doesn't necessarily mean they're punching somebody, but they're just more edgy and reactive. Um, so that's kind of the general state that you're going to see the employees in as you're beginning to talk to them about what does it mean to begin to move towards whatever our new normal is going to be. So, Bob, you're going to talk to us about some ways as leaders that we can operate mm-hmm. with that. I am. Your, your corporate culture or the culture of your work team is so important here. There are a lot of studies that talk about when a group goes through a hardship, whether it's a sudden impact tragedy or it's an ongoing marathon like this, the individuals within that group draw a lot of strength from how they view their team and how they view the leadership of that team. I can be strong because you're strong. Um, To quote Rudyard Kipling in Jungle Book, the strength of the pack is the wolf, the strength of the wolf is the pack, right? So I'm sure that you recruited, interviewed, hired, trained, and have resourced superstar wolves. But when they draw a sense of my leader knows his or her stuff, my leader cares about me, and my team is tough. We'll figure this out. People draw a lot of strength from that team versus nobody gives a rip and they're clueless. Then I feel weaker. Um, it's important to recognize that we're human too. Leaders are human too. 
we tend to think about the fight, flight, freeze. Oh gosh, that's the people that I'm serving. And I'm an engineer. I don't know how to do that stuff. I'm really good at engineering or construction or whatever else my technical re responsibilities require. But leading people, we're human too. And so we're, we experience sleep loss and appetite loss and digestive adventures and inability to concentrate um, all of that, the irritability, we experience all that too. And as leaders, we tend then when we become anxious to flee to something that we see as our perceived strength. And that's a good thing. It's good we have those strengths. It's good to have strengths. But any strength overused can become a weakness. And so what we see, as I see working with our EAP clients, is that high stress tends to make you somewhat of a caricature of yourself. It makes you more of what you already are. Okay, think about contentious family meetings. Think about family funerals, if there is something that was complicated about it. Think, people, think about your 10-year class reunion. People did the same thing they did only more. And leaders tend to do the same as well. And you know, caricatures turn you into Squidward or Dumbo, right? And I see leaders do that. And so leaders who think, I'm really analytical under high stress may become paralyzed by that analysis. And they may lock themselves into their office and figure out beautiful spreadsheets and forget about their people. People who are really articulate may never shut up. People who think they're funny may be too funny when it's not warranted. People who are empathic may become a puddle. And so it's important to, to know yourself, okay, when I feel threatened, I tend to go to this, um, when is that not helpful? When do I need to have enough self-awareness or a good team that gives me feedback so that I can turn into my own skid a little bit? Okay, just some self-awareness as a leader. People are looking at you. If you feel like under normal circumstances, people aren't listening, <laughs> or if you feel like, okay, nobody has their camera on during a Zoom call or they're all just on Facebook while I'm talking. Um, when people are stressed, they're paying attention and they need you to be comfortable being uncomfortable. They need you not to flee to either bank. Because frankly, when we think about that, when we flee to either bank, it isn't necessarily because we're leading our people well, it's because of our own uncomfortability, right? And so we need to be able to present, yep, this is hard, let's do it. Let's do it. Presenting it is really important saying we are uncomfortable. Just acknowledging it gives people permission. It does. It does. Because remember that black and white thinking that, that we were just talking about and trust is in jeopardy. And the worst thing that I see is a leader who minimizes, denies, make jokes out of, pretends it isn't there. So don't wallow in it. Don't be overly dramatic. You can get that online or on television at any moment. You don't have to provide that. But deal with reality and say, here we go forward. So believe in your strengths. And you have to actually have that sense of, okay, we can do this. Because people aren't listening to what you say, but boy, are they watching. And they see you. They see you. And, and if you don't, all the things that we talked about before can produce fragmentation. We talked about fight, flight, freeze. Okay, fighting produces fragmentation. So does flight. And that can take various forms of people like who don't put their cameras on during meetings. That's a form of flight sometimes. Uh, people who just don't share their opinions because they're afraid they'll be ridiculed. People who don't be real. And the freeze, that numbness, um, boy, you don't get much out of that employee either, do you? So it's really important. How do we pull our team together and you use plural pronouns and future tense verbs? We will, we can, we shall, because an expectation of recovery is a critical element in recovery. And then communicate, 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 communicate. Um, nature hates a vacuum. And when people are frightened, their imaginations can be very creative and destructive, right? So don't leave it out there. You cannot communicate too much. And so we want to talk just a little bit about some communication tools or a process um, that we think is helpful.
Um, so in, in, this is an acronym um, we developed in a company I used to be president of for crisis communication and it's ACT, okay? And the A is to acknowledge and name the issue. Don't duck it, don't minimize. And we do, we tend to, we tend to duck and minimize. Um, example of that is if, if someone passes away, it's real easy once the hand runs in the church basement or stale, you never use that person's name again. You never talk about them again. And that is really harmful for those who are most, most um, impacted by it. It's really hurtful for them. And so it's important to use the real words. It's important to acknowledge, okay, if leading my team, when we get back together, it's important to say, you know, this is awkward. This is really awkward. We're really all sick of the word unprecedented, but it's true. And so we're figuring this out as we go. We're listening to smart people, but we're, this is awkward. And some of you believe it's all a conspiracy theory driven by politics or money or whatever it may be. And some of you are very, very concerned about it. And some of you had had the experience of nobody you know has been impacted by it. And some of you have lost people. And so we're just gonna acknowledge that this is hard and we're gonna figure this out. And these are the policies and this is how we're going to do it. And we just need to figure out so we can focus on what we can do instead of being paralyzed by what we can't. That's that goes for establishing new policies too. So if your policy, like at Pine Rest, the policy is you have to wear a mask yet, but you have to acknowledge that there are some people that are not gonna like that policy. And when you can acknowledge, like, I know there are some of you that aren't going to agree with this or that are going to think this is dumb. We get that. It gives them permission so they don't have to like prove their point to you because they feel hurt. Right. So deal with reality, deal with reality. We've all had losses. We've all had losses through this, whether it's a loss of a loved one or just loss of stuff we love to do and going out to dinner and weddings and track meets and all of those kind of things. It's important to acknowledge it. Um, when people get bifurcated thinking, they, let's talk about loss. They tend to say, do we grieve or do we move forward? Right? They go, do we grieve or do we move forward? And some people, it's really important for them to really grieve and to lament and to mourn. And for them, it feels disrespectful to move forward. And other people say, heck no, I'm not going back there. That hurts. And I'm powerless. I need to get back to my emails. I need to build something. I need to do a project. I need to break something cheap. I need to do something where I have some control and I'm not emotionally vulnerable. You can see how that would fragment a team, doesn't it? Couldn't you? And so looking Sorry, at this. Yep. Go ahead, Jean. Okay. See, some of, part of the deal with that is also that some people are having to leave the loss of what was still because they're just now owning like, oh, we're never going to go back in the way it, and be the way it was before. And some people are having to grieve what they're going to lose by going forward. Like I liked being at home. So that grief isn't always about losing someone. Sometimes it's about losing a, a sense of something. Yes. Independence, autonomy, ability to make my own decisions. For some people, Oh, they can't wait to get back around the water cooler and share donuts and talk about the weekends. And for other people, they dread that stuff. And so there are losses in both directions, aren't there? Some people love staff meetings. Some people hate them. For some people, Zoom calls are the greatest thing in the world. Not everybody, right? So it's important to acknowledge that and to acknowledge that people are in different places and that's okay. Um, the next is communicate, communicate, communicate. So Pertinent information, you have to do it with both competence and compassion. And again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna encourage leading with the compassion. I want my boss to give a rip about me. I want my boss to know their stuff, absolutely. But I want them to, to give a rip about me as a person, not as an employee number, not as uh, an economic unit. And so, but that information needs to be pretty bite-sized especially the more frightened people are, the less capacity they have to read long emails with polysyllabic words and lots of commas in the sentences, okay? So make it short-term. This is what we know at this time. 
Don't guess, don't conjecture, because that will become gospel and it will become distorted. Share what you know for sure in bite-sized pieces that are short-term right in front of me. And that's wise also because none of us know what it's going to look like six months from now. We didn't know what it was going to look like six months ago, right? So how do I get through today? How do I get my technology hooked up again back at the office or not? How do I deal with what's right in front of us? And this it's important for this communication always to be forward-looking. Yes, we acknowledge what was behind, but there needs to be a transition to immediate, concrete, practical next steps. What do I do next? How do I handle these conversations? Um, and there are so many different scenarios. I mean, you have to deal not only with your own staffs coming together, but what about your strategic partners and your vendors and your clients and your customers and all of those um, those next steps too. So the details are important, but lead with compassion. Yeah. Any comments about any of that, Gene or Rebecca, as you're thinking about workplace scenarios? I would say the other thing is make sure that the communications don't, cut, like if you can, wait until you actually either communicate that you don't know yet and you'll let them know when you know, or communicate the piece you know, but when you say one thing one day and then you change it the next day because you haven't really decided yet, that means that team will lose confidence in you pretty fast. So if you don't know, tell them you don't know and that you will get there. Don't decide and then change, decide and then change, unless you have to. I mean, obviously there are things that we're having to decide and change as we go, but the more you can give a consistent message and it doesn't feel like you don't, they think and trust it, the better off you that's good. A, a secure leader will be able to say, I don't know yet, but we'll let you know. And this is how we'll continue to inform you. This is how we will keep letting you know. But um, sometimes when we're anxious as leaders, we feel like we have to magically have all the solutions, right? For the next 10 years of their life. And that gets us into big trouble and really leads to train wrecks within our teams. So Bob, what a lot of employers are dealing with right now is deciding what their policy is going to be, at least in the short term, uh, now that the laws have changed and uh, there's some freedom now uh, for employers to decide on a masking policy with, within certain guidelines, which hopefully everyone knows. Uh, but, but employers for the first time in a while do have some choices and then they have to communicate those choices to their workforce. Are we still going to require everyone to wear a mask? Or are we going to say those who are vaccinated no longer need to wear a mask? And are we going to require proof of vaccination? Or are we going to say, if you're not wearing a mask, we're going to trust, right, that you're being honest. Those are, are really tough decisions uh, for our clients. But I want to get to the communication piece here, because how those decisions are communicated, I think, could make or break uh, whether that decision ends up going over well with the workforce, given everything you've discussed up until now, you and Gene, about the anxieties that everyone's feeling. I have a specific question about C uh, in your slide. What is the difference between communicating with competence and communicating with compassion? What is that, what is that compassion piece specifically? How can leaders incorporate that into communication? Okay. So again, looking at um, a caricature, somebody who sees themselves as really competent may communicate in a way that's rigid and policy driven and this is what we know at this time and this is what the spreadsheets say. What's that experience like for someone who's afraid? You know, great, my boss knows what she or he's talking about, but I don't feel like they care about me. I don't trust them to follow them. And on the other side, if somebody is just compassion, they may blubber and how do you follow that, right? And so I think it's important to do both, but the compassion piece would be understanding the person as a person. So I understand that for some of you, this is really a frightening thing. And I'm sorry that this is what you're experiencing. I mean, I know for some of you, it's just irritating and annoying and I understand and I get that. Um, so just 
acknowledging it as you say it, and then I think checking in with people, asking them on a regular basis as a leader, what's this like for you? How you doing? How's your family doing with this? Um, Gina, I understand your daughter's immunocompromised. What's it like for you now to be in a meeting where some people are wearing masks and some aren't? Is that a, how, what's that like for you? How can we make this more comfortable for you? Are there things we can do rather than just focus on what we can't? So I think that goes a long, long, long way. And when you can help people know the process you use to get to your decision, that you didn't just pull it out of a hat, um, and you didn't just arbitrarily make it, um, but that there was a reason you thought it through. And this is why we believe this is the best decision we know to make right now. As we get more data, we'll reevaluate that data in these ways and we may adjust our decision. Um, that's different than if you just, this is the way we're doing it. And people are like, and why? Right? But if you can give them some rationale, and, does it, and you can't always. But when, and you don't have to give them the nitty gritty, every blow by blow of how you got there. But if you can give them the overarching of why you believe this is best for them and for those that you're serving, um, that can help. It really does. And, and engaging external experts is helpful also because there are areas of expertise. I mean, I didn't know, I know a whole lot more about COVID now than I did a year ago and wish I didn't, but I do. Um, but pulling in the experts from the outside can be helpful, you know, whether that's your law firm, um, whoever that might be, but be prepared that our, you know, we're, we're fragmented. Um, I've been in meetings lately where the health department were the wonderful angels that everyone was so grateful to, and they were the hated enemy, um, in the same meeting, just depending on that. But, but there is value in pulling in respected experts from the outside as well. This is why we decided this will be our policy. We talked to Rebecca Strauss at Miller Johnson. <laughs> Can always throw me under the bus, folks. That's, mm -hmm. that's what we get paid for. Uh, is, is this a good time to ask some more questions? Anybody yes, please. Some really interesting questions uh, from some of our attendees um, and that I know uh, everyone, it's on everyone's mind. Let's just start with the one uh, that's really top of mind. Uh, how do leaders deal with conflicts in the workplace between vaccinated and unvaccinated uh, employees? What, what are your suggestions? What I'm going to go back to acknowledge the fact that people are going to really disagree on this. People are really going to disagree on this. And it all depends upon what news channel you watch, right? And people are going to disagree. So sharing that. Setting, I think setting in place an expectation, we're going to treat each other respectfully and professionally, regardless of this very emotionally laden um, topic issue. And to say, some of you aren't afraid, okay, but be respectful of those who are really concerned about this, because you don't know. They may have an 88-year-old parent living with them with you know, that's at high risk. And so there may be really good reason for someone to be anxious about it. And also to say some people aren't, and we need to respect that as well. Um, so the standards, you know, whether it's, there are a lot of divisive issues. It can be around politics, it can be about race, religion, gender. There are a lot of things we could fight about and that could divide our teams but we're expected to respect each other even when we disagree. And, um, you know, there's certain conversations that just shouldn't, shouldn't take place in the workplace. There are certain conversations and certain conversational tones that especially should not take place in the workplace. And so we're gonna be professionals. A lot of the same things that you would use around diversity and inclusiveness can be used, take those exact same skills and apply them to this issue. Yeah. That's a great insight, uh, Gene. My, my two cents on it from a legal perspective. So, so Gene and Bob are going to give you the really helpful <laughs> responses, the practical advice, and I'll put the legal spin on it. My advice about conflict in the workplace uh, over mass or over vaccination status, because I see those as two high conflict areas, is to focus on the behaviors. We cannot control our employees' thoughts or beliefs nor should we. 
frankly. Uh, right? That that's not what we're in the business to do. Although maybe maybe pine rest and behavioral health a little bit more. But but for all the rest of our clients, uh, that that's not what we're in the business of doing. But we can uh, express our expectations regarding behavior. Right. So if you can uh, try to separate the behavior from the thoughts and the belief system and give, I would give people the freedom to believe what they want to believe, right, without uh, criticizing or saying they're crazy or, right, they're watching the wrong news channel, uh, to Bob's point, and say that that's okay, what's going on in your head uh, can stay there and that's legitimate, uh, but in the workplace, we must treat each other with respect. We must use respectful uh, voices, right? We must follow the company policy. And if the company policy, which is based on science, CDC guidelines, and the law, say that, for, for instance, for an employer that says not everyone has to wear masks anymore, and that's your policy, uh, we're following all of those things, right? And, and you, if we do those things, we will be safe in the workplace, and we need to behave ourselves Accordingly. So that, that's just my little twist on that, to separate out the behavior expectations from what's going on internally uh, in someone's mind. But, um, but there's, there, there, will be, there will certainly be conflicts, and the reality is there's no way to, uh, there's no magic pill here, right, uh, yeah. to make everyone happy with each other and agree with each other's choices and never make a snide comment. Um, I that was that. true. That was true in 2018 too. <laughs> you know, it was. It was. And and we don't always like all the people we work with, but we still need to be professional. And we still, if we're going to be professional, we don't need to convince everybody to agree and believe just like we do. Yeah. Okay. Let's. Let's. Um, I'm going to toss this one. This is definitely one that's mostly just for you guys. Uh, I'll, I'll just read the question. I work in a smaller company with a management team of five people. We all have very different views on return to work, how we've responded to the pandemic, how we've dealt with the stress. It's tough when the leadership team itself is stressed. What is your advice to this leadership team? <laughs> well, do you remember growing up in a family when mom and dad disagreed about something? Um, that was that was an environment that was rife for terrorism, right? For all of us kids, we knew who to ask, who not to ask. We knew how to split them, and we knew how to get what we wanted. Um, when I'm consulting with leadership teams that experience that kind of difference in opinion, I use that analogy a lot. Okay, if you want if you want your team to be a bunch of acting out thirteen year olds, continue doing what you're doing um, because that will fragment you and your customers will be able to tell and your competitors will cheer if that happens. Um, sometimes you just have to focus on what do we agree upon and let's start there. It's so easy to focus on what we don't agree on. It's so easy to focus on what we don't have control over where we feel powerless. What do we agree on? Let's start there and see if from that critical mass we can build out. And also acknowledging not everybody's going to be 100% happy with the outcome. We don't have to be 100% all in agreement, but we need, going back to your point, Rebecca, even though what's going on in our head and maybe in our heart and in our blood pressure is different, our behavior has to be unified. Because if we don't, everybody's watching us. And if they already have those disparate views and we come across as fragmented as a leadership team, boom, right? So whether we agree or not, we are messaging and our behavior and our messaging when our peers aren't present, all has to be consistent with the company line, has to be. We can argue it out behind closed doors, but when we walk out, we have to be a unified team. Um, and then I think the other piece is leaders as a whole, particularly senior leaders, um, but all of us as leaders can tend to not take care of ourselves. Um, and the COVID has actually made that easier. It's made it easier to not take vacation. It's made it easier to not have good boundaries around when work is over. 
And if you're not taking care of you, and you know, Bob's going to look at me and sometimes say, pot calling kept black. Um, but if you're not taking care of you, your resilience and your ability to manage those things when your employees um, or when your coworkers on your leadership team are not in the same place goes down considerably. So even things like getting good sleep, but taking time away, checking out of email, um, those things will help you have better energy to come back and work mm-hmm. at it again. And it can feel like, well, we're a small company. I can't afford that. It may actually be you can't afford not to do that. Yeah, because people, again, they're listening, but they're watching. And if you, you can craft a beautiful email, but if you look like a wreck, guess what? Guess what they read and they believe. Yeah. Yeah. And you may think you look just fine, but if you ask them, they can tell you you don't sometimes. So. (laughs) Thank you. I, I'm never going to ask anyone I work with how I look on any given day. <laughs> <laughs> my, 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 I don't want the answer, so how I feel about that. Yeah. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to combine two questions into one because they're very similar, and um, I, I know they're on the minds of, um, of lots of our folks in the employment community. Uh, and it, it has to do with employees who are either unwilling or anxious about coming back to work in person. Uh, So the questions are uh, how to handle an employee that is unwilling to return to work in person, uh, and what if an employee expresses anxiety about returning to work in person. So I'm going to handle the legal uh, angle on this first, uh, but that's only part of the story, right? Because just responding to an employee that says our lawyer says we can. Uh, it's probably not a great employee relations strategy. So, so I'm going to answer the legal, uh, the legal side of this and then toss it to um, Bob and Jean for their take on how to actually handle it, handle the employee's anxiety well. Uh, from a legal standpoint, uh, you can set the, the expectations of your, uh, of your workplace. And if you require certain positions to be in person, you can absolutely require that. You may have to make exceptions. Uh, for disabilities, right, for qualifying disabilities under uh, the ADA. Now, this is a, the reasonable accommodation process that many of us are familiar with and were familiar with before COVID, uh, but it kind of got overshadowed by COVID, right? And um, we, we, we tend to think that COVID has, it has created new rules in this area, but really not. So we have to somehow get in a time machine and go back to pre-COVID and think about if an employee asks for an accommodation and working from home when the general rule is to work in person is an accommodation, uh, how would you handle that? And my guess is you do have a process, right? You would first determine whether they had a qualifying disability under the ADA and ask for medical documentation uh, if it's a non-obvious disability. And then if it is a qualifying disability, you would decide, uh, is this a reasonable accommodation and does it pose undue hardship to the workplace? Uh, There is something that may have changed with COVID. Uh, Pre-COVID, courts were real supportive of employers requiring in-person work. They were not um, sympathetic in some instances to work from home requests, but much more supportive of employers mandating in-person work requirements and saying that was an unreasonable accommodation in many cases, to allow employees to work remotely. Now that so much of the country has been working remotely uh, for a year and a half, the court's position on that um, may change. We just haven't seen cases uh, go through the system. So um, if there is a qualifying disability, that's a great time to seek advice of legal counsel to help you determine whether that's a reasonable accommodation and how the EEOC or courts may look at it. Uh, but, but subject to that accommodation exception, um, you can, uh, as an employer now under Michigan uh, rules, require employees to work in person. So, so that's the, the legal aspect of it. Bob and Jean, how do we deal with employees who, uh, who get that, may not qualify for an accommodation, but express anxiety for any number of reasons about coming back to work? I think how you handle it may push where it may end up whether or not they need to have an accommodation or push it to that place. So we want to actually, if we can, do some preventative work so we don't have a bunch of people bringing in notes from doctors and then we have to do the other piece. And I think if you can acknowledge like that makes sense that you would be anxious, you haven't been doing that, 
what things, will, and then asking the question, what things will help you to become more comfortable? Can we break it down into smaller steps for you? Um, well, you know, just because we've said masks aren't necessary, it doesn't mean you can't wear a mask. Or just because we've said masks are necessary, how can we help that make, make that work for you when you're not comfortable wearing a mask for the day? Kind of walking them through it in smaller steps. Um, that, but that doesn't mean you have to be their counselor. You can also look at, and we have an EAP that you can use because that anxiety makes sense. And if you don't learn to manage it now, it's not necessarily going to get better on its own. So this is a space where you could see that you can't necessarily mandate that, but you can offer it as a resource that you have available for them. Um, but asking them like, what will help? We need to get you between point A and point B. We understand you're not ready for that yet. We don't want to, we're not asking you to jump, but how can we incrementally walk you there? Bob, other things you got to that? Yeah, I'm thinking back. Um, I may or may not have passed physics, but I remember Newton's law that an object in motion tends to stay in motion, an object at rest tends to stay at rest unless some force acts upon them. And and it's amazing how small change leads to big change. And if small change is okay, so you're not ready to do this yet. Let's take a look at what are some steps, what are some things that you can do that would help. Um, to get closer to that. And it's amazing how just getting over one hurdle, presenting some sense of safety um, and realistically taking safe steps is helpful. I don't know if um, I used, the company I was president of responded to about 10 bank robberies a day across the United States. And, um, you know, one of the things that they would often do after a robbery would be to bring in um, a security officer to sit in the corner of the lobby. Okay. Now, some of those security officers, I'm sure, were very professional. Some of them weren't. But that sense of safety, did it make them any less likely to be robbed the next day? No. And if there were a robbery, having that security person maybe increase the risk. But they found that people came back to work at, in greater percentages because of the company cared, the company took a step towards safety and it's visible. And so if you can help people, okay, this is what we're gonna do. These are the steps we're gonna take to help you to feel safe, to reduce your anxiety about coming back, communicate about it, make it visible. Small change leads to big change. Mm -hmm. There are also folks who are gonna just use it to manipulate and you knew who they were in 2018 too, right? <laughs> this is true. This well said. Okay, uh, we've got another really great question and another few minutes uh, left in the hour. So, and this one is, is mostly uh, for you, for you guys, uh, Gene and Bob. How do you communicate that some employees must return to the office while others may be able to have more flexibility in continuing to re work remotely and the sense that that is not fair and, and okay I'll put a little legal spin on Let, let's assume this is not for disability accommodation reasons let's assume that this is because different departments managers job codes etc may lend themselves in management's point of view may lend themselves more to remote successful remote work where others don't and now you've got some employees that may disagree right and, and are unhappy uh, with the category they've been uh, put in that they have to come back to work. So how do we communicate this without creating a sense of perceived unfairness? That's a um, Sorry about, go ahead. I think it comes down to job function. Um, you know, are, does successful completion of your job require for you to be present in the office? Does successful completion of your job not require you to be in your office. If I'm a remote salesperson, no, I don't need to come into the office very often. I may need to go to a lot of clients' places face-to-face. -face. Um, Pine Rest, because I don't work in inpatient setting, I think I've been on Pine Rest campus a dozen times in 15 months um, because they frankly prefer I'm not there because that increases risk. But if I was a nurse on an inpatient unit, yes, I've had to be there every single day. So I, I think it would have to be, re what do you need to do to be successful in your job and to meet your individual goals as well as our team and our organizational goals? Yeah, and those organizational goals become a, a rallying point. You can say, can we agree that our job, that we are committed to providing 
X service and we want to provide it with excellence. And as our leader team, as our leadership team thought about how to provide that service with excellence, at this point in time, we believe that the best way to do that is by having these people be here because we think they can do X better by doing this. And these people be here because we believe that they can do X just as well either place. But we're open to hearing why you think that might be different. We don't necessarily believe that will change our mind. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. And we'll reevaluate um, those things. Because if they can get committed to the goal, like we want to provide an excellent service, and they can understand that why you're thinking that job is better done in the office, why you think this job has more flexibility. And also, it may not be fair, but it may be what works. In a, I mean, fair in terms of like, Everybody gets it. My kids used to argue about fair. I had a boy and a girl and they would argue about fair. And I would occasionally say, well, you guys don't wear underwear that looks the same. And that's not fair. I suppose so you will not wear the same stuff. <laughs> like, oh, that's stupid. Right. Well, okay. But that's because you're different people. Right. So fair is just as what we actually want. Not fair. We want just. And it's also true that that conflict or that tension is likely not due to being in work. It may come down to, Childcare um, issues like that that are more about the person than about the profession, and um, I think it's important to keep that in mind as well. There's a, everyone um, swimming in their own pool on this, as I like to say, right? Yeah. Uh, and it's it's really easy for us to take our own experience and extrapolate that and assume everyone else is living the same experience. And why can't they just come back to work? And I love coming back to work. And, uh, yeah. What is wrong with people, right? But I have older children that don't need childcare. Thank goodness, right? So, so my situation is much different than folks with younger children, and all the day camps are still closed, and uh, I have no plans for that. And uh, what the heck am I going to do? So, it, I think it is important to recognize people are coming at this from all different angles. Which, which brings me to my last question, uh, which is not typed in, but comes from some real client questions recently. Uh, what advice do you have from employers who? have employees who express anxiety about the workplace based on um, what the employers feel are, um, I'm not even sure it's the right way to say this, but um, unfounded uh, anxieties. And I already said you have to respect everyone. You should respect everyone's beliefs and where they're coming from. But for instance, uh, we've had some employees say that they can't come back to work or won't because they have read that people who have been vaccinated are actually dangerous. Uh, to those within a close proximity of them. This is something that is um, shared on the internet. Um, and so some people on this webinar may have different feelings about that. Uh, but uh, talk to us, Jean and Bob, about folks who have certain beliefs about what's going on and what the company should do, uh, perhaps with the vast majority uh, of leadership and coworkers uh, would think is not reasonable. Hmm. I think it would start from the same place of acknowledging it's a valid fear for them. Like if, if they truly believe that being around someone that's vaccinated is dangerous, that's a real fear for them and it's part of their value system. But that doesn't mean you can change what your policies are. You can explain your policies and you can use some of those same things to manage anxiety. What will help us get you back to in the office? given that we've made these, like Bob was talking about earlier, we've made these decisions based upon CDC guidelines, um, based upon these laws. These are the decisions we, we, we believe are going to be the best of the ones we're going to keep. We understand you believe something different. How can we help you get comfortable coming back to work um, given those differences? We're not asking you to change your mind, but how can we help make it okay so that you can be here? Bob, what would you add? I think you also use um, your benchmark. You know, other employers are going to require the same thing. And if you need a job and you need to work and you need to provide for your family, um, we just want you to know that this is the standard that employers are following. And so we are too. We want to be accommodating. We care about you as a person, but this is the professional standard. So how can we help you feel safer in getting there? Because we don't want you to be unemployed living in your van. That is uh, that is great advice. I bet several of our listeners are actually writing that. Mm. Now. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll be using it in client communication. 
Uh, well, it's nine o'clock, so it's time to say goodbye uh, to everyone. Bob, Jean, thank you so much for being here this morning. You're such a valuable resource uh, for the employer community. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, to everyone uh, who came to listen this morning, uh, we hope this is helpful. We hope you take care of yourselves. This has been an extraordinarily stressful uh, year and a half for employers, uh, dealing with your own personal stresses and then absorbing the stresses of your employees and, and the leaders in your organization and being that, especially for the HR folks uh, who are attending, kind of being that buffer uh, between the two. It's been, it's been a really tough year. Uh, I'm super glad we're on this side of it instead of back where we were the last time we talked about in April. So I hope everyone stays well and is productive and we'll see each other soon. Thank you. Thank you all.